Well, all right, folks. Um, today's presentation is about how we're using K probes and U probes together to try and enhance observability. Uh, well, how do people even go about understanding why their systems are suddenly slow, right? Well, there are many ways to go about it, but one of the very common ones is that you have a high level metric or a high level performance indicator, and that just suddenly shoots up, right? Uh, and at that point, you don't really know much more than that. You have to try and use tools and like, it, it is not standard the way you have to try to drill down from that high level performance indicator down to the root causes of why things are now slow. Uh, so you can, for example, you can, for example, use for, uh, CPU profiling, uh, flame graphs or distributed traces to try and see if any of the functions stand out. And hopefully at the end of this process, you've identified a culprit function, which is definitely taking longer than it should. But even then, it's not obvious at first glance why that function is slower, uh, because latency degradation can have several different root causes, or as we like to call them, the horsemen of latency degradation. Uh, bear with me, I know that there are more than four, it's just I really wanted to use this reference. So I guess the point here is that a lot of these horsemen are actually outside of user land and by the usual uh, latency only tracing of functions, you don't really see them at play, so it's not obvious. Uh, so really our idea with X probes, which are hybrid U probes and K probes is essentially just, we, we wanna trace them all. Uh, what, <laughs> trace all the horsemen, right? And because of the amazing work that's been done by the BPF and the BCC communities, we, we now can. Um, so let's go with an example. Things will become clearer. So this is a situation you might have found yourselves in sometimes. You know it for a fact that function A used to run well. It was quick. Everything was fine. And then suddenly it, it's slow now. Uh, well, it's not immediately obvious why that is until you start uh, getting more information about what is being done with that latency, right? So when you start being kernel informed, you may get this kind of picture, which is saying that your function is not necessarily doing any more work. It is really just spending time outside of the CPU for whatever reason. So that gets you a little bit closer to the root cause of it. And in this case, the root cause of it is actually pretty silly. I just ran two programs on the same CPU core and you know had them fighting for cycles. So that, that created CPU contention and that was the reason for this specific slowdown. But what I really want you guys to think is uh, I guess broader in terms of all the cool indicators that we can get, all of the interesting patterns that can emerge once you start getting your traces to be more kernel informed. So you can look at the IO latency that's being taken by each function, the off CPU latency, the lock latency, all, all of those kernel, infor kernel concepts that we're currently not getting with latency only tracing, right? Um, so, but I guess the next question is, how do we even get all of this data? And uh, well, the pieces are pretty much there. I'll, I'll enumerate what we have now and essentially the small delta that we did in order to get things working together, uh, K-probes and U-probes talking to each other. So uh, currently, you, we all know there are K-probes and they can introspect on all of these events like context switches, mutexes, file system uh, reads and, you know, the sort, locks. Uh, but the thing is, they only look at these things from the process perspective, which is the PID point of view. Uh, I know you guys are going to say, yeah, of course, we can get the stack traces that are running on a PID. But for our purposes, we really, this is not ideal because we, uh, the stack traces don't give us when the function began and when the function ended, right? So uh, we actually need to know when each invocation began and ended so that we can attribute the resources taken by each invocation. Uh, and this is exactly what U probes give you, which U probes know exactly when a function begins and when the function ends. Uh, and even better, BCC currently has instrumentation that can keep a shadow stack of the, the process at BPF map space. And that shadow stack is uh, essentially mimicking the, the stack of the process with all the trace functions, right? So this is all public. This is all on BCC right now. Essentially, our job was to realize that these things are currently not talking to each other and uh, well, essentially do that. So we created attribution logic for each of the specific K probes that we are interested in. And uh, we make the, the, the K probes talk to the shadow stack that's being kept by the U probes. And we can then attribute resources and get all those bars that, we, that I showed you. 
so let's talk about the attribution logic for, for a while. So essentially, here's an example. We have um, thread zero running function A and thread one running function X, right? So now events are gonna start happening and we're gonna see how things change up from that. Uh, so the first event that happens is function A at thread zero calls function B, right? So the U probes are gonna stack function B on the shadow stack of thread zero and we are gonna start the on CPU clock for thread zero at, uh, for function B at that point because it's running on the CPU. Uh, the next thing that happens is a context switch. So from thread zero to thread one, it is pretty straightforward that we now need to stop the on CPU clock from thread zero and start it on thread one so that because that's the one occupying the CPU. That's pretty obvious, right? Uh, so fast forwarding a little bit, let's just say we context switch back from, to thread zero uh, and now function B exited. So we need to do two things now. One is we got to save the on CPU clock somewhere so that it can be useful for any kind of analysis. But a less trivial thing that we need to do is we got to get that on CPU clock and propagate it to the caller of function B, which is in this case function A. And this is because function A can have uh, broadly different resource usages depending on who it calls, right? And uh, we need to profile all of its callees so that we have a good idea of each execution of function A. And this is specifically why it's really useful to use the shadow stack because then you don't need to trace function B, function A, and whatever functions are on your stack separately. You can just trace the one at the top at all times and then propagate the overheads when it uh, returns, right? Uh, speaking about storing stuff, well, there are many ways you can do that. And this is really where a lot of my research was in, uh, trying to understand why, like, how to store these things in a very efficient way, how to get the data that we want to serve several different applications, diagnosis tasks, and that's all fun. Uh, but unfortunately for the rest of this presentation, I'm just gonna have to focus on the elephant in the room, which uh, is the overhead. So uh, let's look at a benchmark and we'll see more about why that is. So I just got Redis, right? Just uh, basic Redis, one machine, my CMU computer, uh, and I benchmarked it. No tracing, no nothing. And the baseline was about 450,000 for GET requests. Uh, their sets are also there, but just let's just focus on the gets right now. Uh, and I use memtier. So, and then I ran the K probes, which are like scheduled context switches, mutexes, and I benchmarked that as well. The overhead was pretty good. Like it wasn't much, right? So emboldened by that, I just said, let's just use our X probes, which are U probes plus K probes to benchmark everything. Uh, and then I was pretty humbled because tracing all the 5,700 functions of Redis as you guys can see, or maybe you guys can't see because the blue bar is really small, uh, <laughs> didn't really work out well for me. We went from 450,000 to 4,000, uh, which is interesting to say the least. Uh, so with that, uh, humbled by that, we were like, okay, let's trace just one of these functions. And then we chose sip hash because it was a very hot function. So at least might as well trace a function that happens a lot, right? Uh, and we traced it in two ways. We got the, the, we trace them with the X probes, which are U probes plus K probes, and we trace them just with the U probes, right? And uh, I guess the takeaway from that is that we can see that running X probes is, the, the, the main overhead comes from, since X probes are U probes plus K probes, the main overhead comes actually just from running the U probes. This was expected. People told us that this, was be, that this would be the case, but we wanted to also break down why running U probes was so slow. So we just created this new uh, U probe, which immediately returns. Uh, so that the, the idea here is if the U probe immediately returns, the, the only overhead that we're gonna see in that U probe, since it's not doing any work, is the trap overhead. And uh, yeah, we people also told us that that was gonna happen and the overhead was mainly just from the trap. The work being done inside the U probe is actually done really quickly. Just context switching into the kernel to run the U probe, that's where the bulk of the overhead is. Uh, so I guess this leads me to the state of X probes right now. We would love to have a fully eBPF solution just because of all the things that this entails, all the features, all the nice stuff, uh, the, the wide adoption for observability. You don't need to instrument any, anything, it just hooks into your program and you can see everything, it's beautiful. We really want that. However, overhead-wise, it's a different story. Um, and well, I guess to finalize this presentation, I'd like to point out 
the, the main things that we'd love to hear from you. And this is why this presentation is shorter. We really want discussions that we, we want a way out of this. Uh, do we, because right now X probes, the overheads are, are too great for them to be taken seriously at all. So do we want to stay, stick with overhead, uh, sorry, stick with new probes? Uh, do we want to, well, maybe the BPF time people are going to make them amazing and we, that's not even a problem. These lights are outdated and they're going to be awesome. Uh, or maybe we don't, we're using U probes where we shouldn't, uh, we should be doing some manual instrumentations and user space maps and just use the K probes to update that. There are several uh, possible designs that we can go about and we'd like to hear from you. Uh, and also if we missed any of the important horsemen, then please do let us know. Uh, because we certainly did. And so I guess, Leslie, um, thank you all for your time and uh, let's trace them all. Okay, while well, uh, everyone else is thinking about questions, uh, one point that I want to make is that you probes can be twice as fast depending on like where you put the probe. If you put a probe in the knob, it will be twice as fast, roughly. Ooh. So, but that requires like compiling your user space uh, code with basically what we do for kernel, like leaving five five byte knob at the beginning of the function. The Which F you can uh, instrument, like not instrument, like you can add some parameter to the compiler. Like, the F entry thing, right? The hmm? five bytes of knobs. Is it an F entry option to GCC, I think? So a fantry is relying on that, but compiler argument, I don't remember how it's okay, called, okay, but okay. there is a compiler argument to, to do this. It's actually a kind of configurable NM stuff, but yeah. Uh, a question. So why do you need uh, you probe at all? Because like you, you trace in changes which happens to a process and everything happens inside the kernel. The what? So uh, any change to your process happens inside the kernel. Why do you need the U probe to just? To well, the U probes are essentially just updating the shadow stack, which we need because we need we need to know for each execution when it starts and when it ends, so that we have one the wall clock time, which is the absolute time that it took, uh, and you can't really know from the kernel events when the function started. Even if you look at the stack traces, it can be the stack trace for it can be the same stack trace, but it can be a different execution, right, of the same function. So that, that's why we use U probes because we know we know it for a fact when the execution started and when it ended, and we can attribute exactly the overheads that are or happening in the context of that one execution, right? And then we store that. Uh, we, we were thinking about the stack trace one, but the, the problem is it many things can happen and the same stack trace can pertain to different uh, executions of the same function. Thank you. No problem. Uh, so Lawrence is asking half of the overhead is instruction emulation in the kernel and Alexei is pointing out that it's not, well, okay, maybe you can just. Well, it's probably Yong Hong, <coughs> he's in the audience, can explain it better. So the u prop worst case can be three traps, if you're unlucky, uh, then it will be very slow. In typical case, when there is no knob, there will be two traps. And if it's just single knob, single byte instruction, because nothing needs to be simulated, it's only like trap into the kernel, then it's a single trap. So I suspect your numbers is this, likely good case of double trap. So if you just yeah put put an up and remeasure, like you will get better results. So your elephant will not be as big. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> That's... Yeah we tested in, in our production hardware and like we were getting like two million U probe executions per second. So it's not as fast as we would like, but it's still plenty fast for a lot of things. Maybe not for tracing malloc free without overhead, but any other questions? Anyone want to add a horseman to the to the pile? I promise I get a bigger picture with more horses. So I have a question. You a uh, couple slides back, like because uh, there you're saying you had a couple more. Like the difference, yes, so this one. So X prop and U prop. So what do you mean here by, by X prop? Because I thought like through the first half of presentation that X prop is just a combination when you use both K prop and U prop. But here you're saying like X prop on this uh, C hash. What does it mean to have X prop on C hash? 
No, it means that the, you're tracing, you're using the U probe to keep the sh the well, the shadow stack is essentially just the SIP hash in this case, right? But the uh, essentially the shadow stack only has one function, yeah. So the the all the K probes are attributing to that one function, and when it ends, the shadow stack is uh, it's completely empty, and then it, when it begins again, the shadow stack has one function again. Oh, I see, and U probe is just a U probe. U probe is just like, function no, latency, no, no for example. At all. Yeah, just a usual like oh. get get the function latency of SIP hash. Thanks. Yeah, there. It's on it. I'm going. So, uh, can we? Or uh, I'm not sure that there, there, how that the EBPF uh, uh, will work. But uh, uh, can we inject some EBPF event from a user space? Can we what? Inject so that are uh, like uh, uh, what's the uh, you you can if you can uh, uh, recompile that the user space uh, program or something like that so that uh, you can uh, add some uh, what's the that the system call. To call back that the, the kernel directory there uh, from there, and uh, uh, that callback just uh, invoke that the summer uh, kernel space uh, EBPF program, then uh, uh, we'll say that the, maybe it will uh, reduce that the, the overhead of use uh, because that are using that the U probes. Uh, it actually that the forcibly uh, we'll say that they put that the. Uh, uh, what's it? The software breakpoint on the user space program, mm -hmm. and uh, emulate that the user space program inside it, so that uh, the overhead is coming uh, from that. Uh, what's it? That are uh, handling that the software breakpoint from user space, so that uh, there we need to ch change that the context and switch context and uh, uh, what's it? That are run uh, callbacks and uh, emulate. That are the instruction, yeah. That will <laughs> take a time, yeah. and uh, re uh, uh, go back to the user space. That will uh, call that the overhead. So that are uh, what the uh, why the uh, knob, uh, what's it that are reduce that the overhead is that we don't uh, we can skip that are emulating that are the the user space you know uh, instruction in the kernel, mm. yeah. So that's our, uh, but uh, if you can, uh, what's it, that call, just call that uh, somewhere, the kernel uh, to invoke that uh, the BPF program, uh, that should uh, uh, reduce that uh, the overhead so much, I guess. From what I understand, you're trying to. Uh, okay. Because that, uh, it, it just takes uh, one uh, uh, system call overhead uh, to call, uh, what's it, invoke, uh, to run the uh, EBPF program. Yeah. But I'm not sure that the uh, EBPF has a such kind of uh, feature, like uh, IO control <laughs> EBPF or something like that. Well, I guess we came to the right place to ask. Yeah. Anyone knows, or do do we uh, can we or inject some user space event, uh, EBPF event, in the kernel? No. Yeah, from yeah, something like that. Just saying this this prog test run, you could just do a BPF syscall and just say, hey, run this this program. That's yeah. I guess one option. I, I don't know if that's quite the shape of the problem you're <laughs> looking to solve, but it's something in that space. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, maybe uh, it's if we can introduce that uh, such kind of feature, like uh, injecting that uh, event, injecting probe or something like that uh, for the uh, uh, EBPF. Yeah, maybe it will uh, reduce that uh, overhead. Uh, most of the overhead of the using that uh, U probes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the problem sense. with this is you like the beauty of your probe is you you take some application that was compiled without any expectation that it will be traced by EBPF or any other means, right? And then like you suddenly can see something, right? Like all the solutions, like like what you're proposing requires like specially instrumenting and compiling the code, which kind of removes most of the benefit, basically. Yeah. But, but I'm actually wondering like if if you combine 
a little bit of user space rewriting, right? Like doing the trampoline in user space, which will do like this either special syscall or whatever, right? And go to kernel faster than the interrupt. Then it might be actually a good solution. Like so VPF time, right? Like the one of the limitations that like if you want to interact with like VPF site uh, maps, you need to do like some sort of kernel interface in that slow, right? Or you need to stay completely in user space and and both are kind of limiting, right? So maybe the hybrid good solution is like to have user space, small trampoline that will just go directly to kernel. Yeah. And like will provide you, you know, whatever the IP was and stuff like this. And that might be a good way forward to, to make you probes faster. Yeah. So like application still doesn't need to know about the instrumentation. It all kind of magically happens, but it's faster. So I would, I would look into that. Would that be a, a mechanism for all you probes or specific like U probes light, like a subset of the U probes. All U probes. I mean, like it doesn't have to be literally U probe. It might be some new type of program if we need to. But like basically, a little bit of user space p tracing or whatever, mm -hmm. and then just kernel support, like to to have like a very lightweight syscall or something where like you pass I don't know one argument, right? So like it takes the minimal amount of code and just. Mm -hmm. Or even run user run uh, the U probe in in user space like they were doing. I think. And writing to a, a map that is then mapped between the kernel and the user space, right? So, so that's what VPF time provides, if I understand correctly, right? The problem is like, okay, if you do one map update, then maybe it's on par as as far as performance is, because like you, it's once this call, right? But as soon as you do two updates per per program run, then like you're losing already. While mm -hmm. like if you just switch to kernel once, then everything uh, else is fast. I see. And yeah. like also you don't have limitations like which pro which map types are supported and all stuff. You just have all of the kernel infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, something like a traditional, uh, what's it, that are uh, asynchronous or synchronous execution program. So that are, yeah. You still the, want synchronous though? No, actually that are, uh, the EB, uh, BPF time is uh, like a, like learning that are asynchronous and are uh, uh, synch, uh, what's it, synchronized that are the result on the map, sharing map. So that are uh, that need to wait or something like that. Mm. But uh, if we are uh, directly call that callback that are uh, the kernel, we I can see. yeah. Uh, think but that's also doing... limiting, right? Like there are situations where like you actually want to grab like the state of the kernel and state of the user space at the same time, and yeah. Uh, maybe we can have a like a tail curve switch from the use space EBPI program running and after the tail code to kernel EBPI program running. I'm think, thinking about this before. Yeah. <laughs> Synchronize. <laughs> Async. Yeah, synchronize. Yeah, maybe we can, uh, or we can re record that the, uh, the different uh, data and uh, let's see. Uh, Afterwards, we can uh, synchronize that are the recorded data. Hmm. Yeah, I see. Yeah, I'd be scared just because functions are changing constantly and uh, waiting to synchronize. If, yeah. if if writes are happening on the kernel space and the kernel events are being attributed to something that's not synchronized, then you're going to start getting stuff that is, that is weird. I think I don't know. I'm not not sure. Yeah, it could be. <laughs> so uh, a comment here. So just based on like the, what we've seen so far today, the BPF time presentation and the attempts that people try to accelerate like U probes and your presentation, elephant in the room, the fast U probes is definitely something that like tracing community need. And uh, like the existence of multiple rewriters the injection frameworks, this like Frida that VPF time is using, that LTNG folks are using Leap Patch, I think it's called. And there are like all sorts of iOS, this injection technology. So people need this kind of stuff to inject the code. But all of this user space to user space code injection, uh, VPF time including, and if LTNG folks were in the room, they could explain it better. Uh, they all suffer from being in the same context so if BPF or anything else, LTTNG, they're all running in the context of the task that they inject to, they share the same fate, meaning the signals are all the same. They share the same like file table, they share the same memory, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, for example, if you're tracing a task, they're doing like close all, 
syscall, like it will close all file descriptors. And let's say you set up a ring buffer from your like user space VPF program that's supposed to like transfer. The task doing close all will just like kill of your tracing. And similar with Malik, because Malik is shared between so I think like LTNG, BPF time, and everything else, like all of this injection, they suffer from this issue. And in 80% of the cases, it's okay, but corner cases makes it like impractical in many conditions. So I think the design parameters for this like fast two probes would be to switch from this task context into some other context, maybe of different task. But if it's different task, it's probably same as switching to kernel. So I think that's sort of main design requirements, taking the user task and switching to kernel as fast as possible with a system call or something else. It's probably mandatory part of the solution. Otherwise, there always will be issues. Even today, uh, looking at U probes and especially like U red probes, like U probes typically don't crush user space, but U red probes do. Like even though like kernel is trying to do as accurate as possible, but depending on application, depending on what it's doing, you just put a U probe in there and it will take fault. So well, it's it's actually a kind of protection mechanism by the kernel when it detects that it cannot match the return to the entry, which can happen like when the user space like does the stack swap. So like for, um, what's, what's it called? The, forgetting this term, uh, fibers, for fibers, for example, or maybe even for coroutines, I don't know, but yeah. Exactly, like fibers, coroutines, all of this like fancy compiler stuff, like <laughs> injection techniques will struggle with this. It's mm -hmm. just, but yeah. But I think that's what we're talking about, right? Like even with like code rewrite, like wouldn't like if someone replaces the stack, like isn't that a problem? Maybe I, I'm just saying like this is this is just another problem to solve. Like, but. So all I'm <coughs> trying to say is that like fast you props is definitely an like, excellent problem to tackle, and lots of people in the companies like really need a solution. Mm -hmm. It makes yep. a lot of sense. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, w one is, well, three actually, sorry. One is, um, does this work with recursive functions? It should. Okay. Um, is there, I, I believe you. Uh, are there. It should. So, the data is going to look a little weird, I think, but it should. Okay. Work with recursive functions. Um, um, so, do, do you think there are situations in which including this tracing may distort? the behavior of the function itself? Oh, by all means, yeah, when the, the blue one, the one we traced all the 5,700, I think once you are at that level, all bets are off and you only, you know, hmm. several interactions that you would normally get or not, you're not really getting because most of the time you're spent running, you're spending running, your CPU is just running the U-probe stuff hmm. and context switching. So um, I, I, I cannot say for sure, but I, I certainly think there is a lot of noise from the tracing on the blue case, the trace all. Uh, one more thing that I, I wanted to mention is that uh, from my perspective, I the one thing that I hate the most is debugging uh, race conditions. So um, Same. If, there, if there is like, uh, if you can measure how long it takes for a function to execute on average, it will be cool if you guys had support so that whenever you get into a case in which it's taking longer than the previous profile expected, then you can just assume it's going to be a race condition. And in that case, I will definitely use uh, the tool. Yes, that's the one of the cool things from like using the shadow stack. You know exactly the the you can have a you have a distribution of how much you expect the the executions to be, and you can have like a threshold for the P90, P99 uh, latencies. And once cool. that crosses, you can actually get the 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 arguments that were. Uh, the, the arguments of the outlier function, you can log the outlier function, you can VPF print K, the outlier function, you can actually get, have this anomaly detector like a watchdog based on the expected distributions of stuff and have a, have a proactive system that throws you like a warning, hey, this function took a long. So yeah, that, that, that is all the cool stuff that we really want to do uh, if this works fast. I will, I will mention though that from my perspective, Overhead is not such a big deal. I obviously don't want to be running experiments for hours and hours, but this is not production, right? This is just me trying to figure out my code, so mm -hmm. I wouldn't worry 
too much from my perspective. Fair, yeah, same. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Clearly, you probes, fast you probes <laughs> is the topic of the day. Uh, yeah, we'll have a break for 30 minutes. Yeah, and come back after that. Thank you. Thanks, folks.